Okay, we're ready. Okay. Good morning, and welcome to another lecture given by Meridian Soul School of the Highest Learning. First of all, this is a school and not a church, and neither are we associated with any religious organizations, Jehovah's Witnesses, or any other denomination you have taught in the world today. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation direct from Yahweh given to Dr. Henry C. Kennedy in the year of 1931. The charts you see pictorially illustrated before you are the results of that divine vision and revelation. I will be explaining the name you see here. Yahweh is the true and correct name of our Heavenly Father, which is once laid down in the scriptures. We have Yahweh symbolized as applied on this chart because Yahweh symbolized himself as applied in many passages of your Bible. We have the cloud extending all around the edge of the chart so that everything on the chart is within the cloud. Just as everything that exists exists within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. In this pure spirit state, Yahweh has no descriptive shape or form in which he is thus with source and substance, the limits and the bounds of everything that exists. Now, when your translators have come across the true and correct name of our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, that usually inserts the English title, Lord. Yahweh taking on a superincorporeal shape and form within himself as the word of son is known as Elohim. Now, superincorporeal means without physical flesh and blood. And in this state, Yahweh Elohim can only be seen through a divine vision and understood through a divine revelation, as stated in Exodus 24, 9 and 10. Then when a Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the Elohim of Israel. Now, remember, they saw Elohim in a divine vision and revelation. Now, when your translators have come across the true and correct divine title, for Yahweh in shape and form known as Elohim, they have usually inserted the English title, God. Yahweh Elohim manifested in a physical body as the Savior of the world is known as Yahshua the Messiah, as stated in John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. And in the 14th verse, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as our God, we got of the Father full of grace and truth. Now, when your translators have come across the true and correct name of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, they've usually inserted false and erroneous names, such as Jesus Christ. But remember, Yahweh in pure spirit as the Father, Yahweh taking on a superincorporeal shape and form within himself as the word of Son is known as Elohim, and Yahweh manifested on the physical body as the Savior of the world is Yahshua the Messiah. Yahweh and his two manifestations, but one spirit. As stated in 1 John 5 and 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, my investigation on your part proves to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that the name and title we teach here are true and correct, but that the names and titles that you have taught in the world today are false and erroneous. For example, look up the letter J. It is not and never has been in any part of the Hebrew language and did not come into existence in any language prior to the Middle Ages. Therefore, such names as Jehovah and Jesus are impossible remnants of our Heavenly Father's true and correct name, Yahweh, and his son, Yahshua the Messiah. Our aims, the primary constitutional objectives of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race, nationality, sex, creed, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called laws of nature and powers laden in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the set of the scriptures compared to religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained that there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved Say the name of Yahshua the Messiah, and tent to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. I watch for it as peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We have prayer by Dr. Miranda Gonzalez.
scripture lesson by Dr. Shirley Cole. Scripture lesson be First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, the first chapter, and Proverbs, the first chapter. Good morning, good morning, class. Let us bow our heart and our mind in prayer this morning. Our most gracious Heavenly Father Yahweh, we are thankful that you woke us up this morning with soundness of mind, of heart and mind and spirit. We're thankful for this blessing of eternal life that you have revealed to the sons in us. We're thankful for the magnification of those things that you have told us from the beginning. We ask you to continue to be our guard, our shield, and our protection during these perilous times that you have foretold us of, for they are here. We ask you for this morning, for quietness, for stillness of heart and mind, and to give due diligence to those things that are about to be presented for they are the food that you have set up for Israel. Thankful for all the hearts you have moved and hope that everyone individually will get uh, some nourishment this morning. These are our blessings we ask in thy son's name, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 Good morning, class. The scripture lesson for this morning's class will be 2 Chronicles, the first chapter, and Proverbs, the first chapter. I'll be reading from the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trainer, the Scripture Research Association, Incorporated. Second Chronicles, the first chapter. And Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and Yahweh, his Elohim, was with him and magnified him exceedingly. Then Solomon spake unto all Israel, to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, and to the judges, and to every governor in all Israel, the chief of the fathers. So Solomon and all the congregation with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon. For there was the meeting, for there was the meeting tent of the congregation of Elohim, which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, had made in the wilderness. But the ark of Elohim had David brought up from Kirjath Jerim to the place which David had prepared for it for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. Moreover, the brazen altar that Bezaleel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made, he put before the tabernacle of Yahweh, and Solomon and the congregation sought unto it. And Solomon went up thither to the brazen altar before Yahweh, which was at the meeting tent of the congregation, and offered a thousand burnt offerings upon it. In that night did Elohim appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto Elohim, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Yahweh Elohim, let thy promise unto David my father be established. For thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And Elohim said to Solomon, because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet has asked long life, but has asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. 
Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee. Neither shall there any after thee have the like. Then Solomon came from the high place that was at Gibeon to Jerusalem from before the meeting tent of the congregation and reigned over Israel. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, which he placed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenteous as stones and cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. And they fetched up and brought out of Egypt a chariot for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so, and so brought they out horses for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria by their means. <clears throat> Proverbs, the first chapter. Then, I'm sorry, Proverbs, first chapter. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance we shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She cries in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. it. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, 
but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh. They would none of my counsel. They despise all my reproof. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safe, shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. That was Proverbs, the first chapter, and Second Chronicles, the first chapter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning, class. My name is Carla Carter. I'll be the host slash moderator for this morning's um, lecture. And for our first speaker for this morning will be Dr. Lasagna Roberts. Dr. Roberts. Good morning, class. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, ma'am. Great. I was just thinking about um, the scripture lessons. So again, in the first one, they were talking about what, what, what do we ask for, right? And we want to make sure that we're not asking to consume upon our lust, but that we are asking uh, those gifts, those spiritual gifts that are going to allow us to be able to have peace or as our last scripture told us to dwell safely right in this existence and um again to be able to have that peace and that comfort the stability in this gospel uh and so they kept talking about knowledge and wisdom and, and we talked about it this in the last class uh that allowing us to stay stable, right? To um, see all that is happening around us, whether in our personal lives or in this world, and to still find that peace within, to, to be connected, be one with our creator, and um, to be governed in our hearts and minds by his dictates. So we were talking Wednesday about how he offers us that peace and that comfort in our knowledge and understanding of who he is and how he actually exists. And that there is a pattern, uh, a very uh, clear established pattern that he has uh, laid out for us that allows us access uh, to this understanding of who he is. So I am going to just quickly revisit a few things just for um, those who may not have been able to join us Wednesday um, so that there is a, a clear introduction into the topics and then we'll continue to build on that. And so again, every time Yahweh gives us the desire and the opportunity to come together and to learn more of him. It's, it's a time worthy of celebration. We all could have been doing something else. Uh, he put the desire in us to be here this morning and to dedicate this time. And it is definitely worth acknowledging. And so now that we physically made it into this space, we've uh, turned on whatever technology we want to ask, as was expressed in the prayer, that we are able to give this the attention that it is deserving. Not my words, so to speak, right? Not Sonia, but our creator, give our creator and whatever it is that is being offered to us uh, as spiritual food, the um, attention that it is deserving of because that's our stability. And in saying that, 
by no means are any of the speakers saying you take my word for it, but we're going through this process of there's always the understanding that it has to be proven, right? So you're looking for the witnesses. So again, we're grateful that we're here and we have this opportunity and, and we just pray that he's able to keep us focused in so that we're able to confirm what he has already revealed we're able to get clarity on some things that we may have been questioning. We are able to have new things revealed to us to build on what he's already uh, put within us to stabilize us. So in the previous class, like I said, we were talking about this pattern. We were in volume three of the Elohim book, and we were working um, with how this body, this physical body, as a tabernacle is a, a manifestation. It's a representation of um, our creator and his um, purpose, pattern, and plan. So we talked about the fact that there is a threefold pattern of in this tabernacle, and it's represented in every system of the body, uh, along with other principles. And so um, we talked Wednesday about how those attributes, those nine attributes are manifested in the nine vessels that we see in the tabernacle. We also can see when we study the body, and we'll highlight some of this today, that we could even talk about how the two mysteries are represented within this body. We can see the mosaic trek at work within this body. We can see the specific functioning of the uh, high priest throughout this tabernacle. Uh, we can see the divine numerology that some of you may have had us, uh, may have heard us speak about before. So we not only get this comparison of the tabernacle and how man is made by the pattern, but we also get all of these other foundational pieces that have been introduced to us in different ways, confirmed in the various functions of the body. So um, let's go ahead quickly. I'm going to just revisit. We talked about uh, what is a pattern and that it is a form or a model uh, purposed for imitation is something designed um, or used for making things. We talked about the origin of the word, the Latin roots, and that it means father. <clears throat> and um, we also talked about uh, tabernacle being a tent or a dwelling place, right? Or a sanctuary. And so then when we went into the Elohim book, what we get on um, page 13 at the bottom in volume three, um, and I'll just, it's okay, I'll just read this part quickly because it's uh, really fast. He talks about the fact, he says, please keep in mind that the tabernacle, which Moses saw in his vision, is a direct transformation of the super incorporeal form, the word of Yahweh, Elohim, and therefore this tabernacle explains or reveals the makeup or composition of the glorious form which outshone the noonday sun. So this tabernacle, again, it explains or reveals. And then it goes on to say, that is the reason that Yahweh called it a pattern, for by it, one can understand the nature and makeup of Yahweh. So again, this pattern helps us to understand the nature and makeup of Yahweh, the physical universe in its entirety, the purpose and plan of Yahweh from Alpha to Omega, and in fact, everything there is to be known or can be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for he has showed it unto them for the invisible things that are made being the tabernacle and everything that conforms unto it, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. And so this is from Romans 1, 19 and 20. This tabernacle is certainly the key to an understanding of Yahweh 
and everything that he has done, created, and intends to do. So again, we revisited the fact that, and this was highlighted in our scripture lesson, we are without excuse. It's a question of what do we ask for? What do we diligently seek? He's given us the witnesses. And so we'll be focusing on the witnesses in the physical body. So um, we also talked about the fact that when we look at the nine systems and when we compare them to the um, attributes, divine attributes, that they appear in triads. We see that three in one unity working throughout the different systems and the attributes. And so the way that they talked about it is that it is a pair bonded together by a third. And so in our first pairing, we had the nervous system, reproductive system, and endocrine system. And those were paralleled with the attributes of intelligence, wisdom, and knowledge. Intelligence corresponding with the nervous system, uh, wisdom corresponding with the reproductive system, and knowledge corresponding with the endocrine system. And so we, um, we, we kind of quickly went through all nine of them and how they align with the attributes on Wednesday. And so um, in this first hour, we're just going to dive a bit more into the nervous system and see the different ways that um, not only this attribute of intelligence is manifested in it, but again, how we see the mosaic trek reflected, uh, functionings of the priests, uh, the two mysteries, and if we have time, we'll look at um, the divine numerology. So when we talked about the nervous system on Wednesday, we talked about the fact that inherent in this um, aligning it to intelligence, we're understanding that it is the life or spirit of the physical body and that uh, by default, the other systems are under its direct control and that without its quickening power, the body would be dead. And so this is compared to the spirit of Yahweh and how it animates all living things. So let's go ahead and um, let's read on page 18 in volume three, where uh, they just tell us quickly to give us a bit of context about this threefold nature. So page 18, and we will start at that second paragraph that says, we have already gone to great extremes. Okay. Um, we have already gone to great extremes to get it across to our readers that Yahweh is spirit. John 424, King James Version. And that everything lives and moves and has its being within spirit. Acts 17, 28. This spirit is the source and substance, the limits and bounds of everything, both visible and both invisible and visible. Yahweh in that state is without any descriptive shape and form, but he took on a shape and form within himself that can only be seen in a vision, and it is by this shape and form. Elohim, that all things invisible and visible, spiritual and materialistic are created. And he, Elohim, is the archetype pattern for everything that is created. Furthermore, this superincorporeal spirit being called Elohim has the power to manifest himself in a physical form of a man, Yahshua the Messiah. 1 Timothy 3.16, John 1.14, King James Version, and to walk around on the earth that he had created. 
We have thus shown Yahweh a spirit transforming himself into two manifestations, a superincorporeal form seen only in a vision or with the spiritual eye and a physical form of a man which can be seen with the natural eye. However, it is the same spirit operating in all three states. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. All right, so what we do then is uh, take this threefold nature that has been explained to us, and then we look at how that threefold nature appears throughout all of the systems. And so uh, we share Wednesday that within the nervous system, the brain represents Yahweh and the spinal cord represents Elohim and the peripheral nerves represent Yahshua. And so the first thing that they do for us in helping us to understand that threefold alignment is they discuss the fact that when we speak to Yahweh and Elohim, we talk about the fact that there is not that fleshly or physical manifestation that exists um, with Yahshua, right? That we're uh, talking about uh, the fact that the these two forms, the brain and the spinal cord, cannot be seen with the physical eye. They are encased in bone. So you have the brain that is encased in the skull and you have the spinal cord that is encased in the vertebral column. So then they go on to talk about the fact that when we look at this brain, just as it's already discussed for us that Yahweh is spirit, uh, they talk about the dynamics of the brain and the fact that it has no particular shape or form, that it is this cloud uh, that governs the body. And why are we likening it to a cloud? Because of its white and gray matter, okay? And so now that we know it has this white and gray matter, uh, it's governing the body. They make the parallel that just like that cloud that led um, children of Israel out of Egypt, this cloud is leading us. And they note for us, that this white and gray matter, uh, it's not just in the brain, but it's present throughout the entire body as it extends through the spinal cord, okay? So when we think about the brain, we're thinking about that white and gray matter that is uh, symbolic of a cloud that is governing the body. So then the next thing that we move into is the spinal cord, representing Elohim as a go-between or mediator because the spinal cord is the go-between or mediator with, between the brain and the spinal nerves. So when we talk about the spinal cord, and we didn't get to go into this on Wednesday, uh, we can use the visual, Carla, that appears after page 20. It doesn't have a number on it, but it's right after that page 20. So it talks about this H, and we'll see this H in a minute. Can you all still hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, so the gray matter that exists in the spinal cord forms the perfect letter H. And they talk about how, do you see it? Not your visual. No, I'm at your page. This is, I don't think um, the digital copy has the visuals right in the same pages as your book. Um, yeah. Uh, Which visual? So look visual for, book? It's gonna it's gonna have a brain and it'll have um, a little hmm, what am I looking at? It's like a slice of the spinal cord that has the H in it. I'm looking at the scans. I don't see any visuals at all. No, I don't think the digital copy has any of the visuals. Okay. All right. So um, so we'll we'll go without that. So the 
gray matter, it, it talks about the gray matter in the spinal cord and that it forms this perfect letter H and that that H is representative of holiness and that this holiness connects to uh, is connected to the son of Yahweh or the word of Yahweh. And so again, remembering that that spinal cord representing the super incorporeal shape and form. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at your charts to see if I. Yep. OK, so it's right there. You see in the bottom right corner where it says cross section of spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And you see how you have that H right there. Yeah. OK, thank you. So. Um, so the spinal cord, super incorporeal shape and form. So he revealed himself in visions and revelations, right? So we know that the high priest under the law wore the words holiness to Yahweh on his miter. And so um, they talk about the fact in this section of the Elohim book that this is pointing to Elohim, the high priest of priests, and the fact that he is holiness himself. And um, we also, they talk about the spinal cord as the intercessor when it comes to prayer. So we'll go ahead and we'll read this section on page 21. So remember I said that there are multiple connections that are being made for each, right? We'll talk about the actual functions that occur, how they relate to the functions of the high priest, but also how they relate to, um, I'll say, our behaviors and actions, what we've been asked to do and why it's in support of that. So it's my, I know these, I'm sorry, I didn't know these pages were different. It's my page 21 in volume three. Um, but for the readers, you all will definitely be able to get there because if you're looking in the physical copy, it should be the same pages. So uh, spinal cord as intercessor, page 21, second paragraph is where you would be reading yeah you're there Carla there is a constant and continuous sending and receiving of messages okay, okay. so I think the pages the pages are the same in the digital copy it's just there's no visual okay so this gotcha. is page 21 second page mm -hmm. okay okay there's a constant continuous sending and receiving of messages that go on between the spinal cord and the brain even when one is asleep the spinal cord keeps in touch with the various parts of the body by means of the spinal nerves, and it in turn communicates with the brain. Thus, it carries on a constant intercession, thereby attending automatically to the needs of the physical body. We do not dictate to the spinal cord what type of message or intercession to make to the brain for us even when we are awake, to say nothing about the time that we are asleep. Therefore, the welfare of the body is constantly supervised or watched over by the spinal cord acting as an intercessor. Now we have likened the spinal cord unto the Holy Spirit, Elohim, which is intermediary between Yahweh and man. Let us see how well that correlates with something the Apostle Paul wrote about in the eighth chapter of Romans. He said, we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes the prayer or intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered and that everything works out all right with this arrangement. Romans 8, 26 through 30. Have we not just told you, have we not just told you how the spinal cord acts in our behalf to do the things that are best or good for the physical body and that it constantly carries on this function? As Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, 
pray without ceasing. Can anyone hear the messages that are transmitted by the spinal cord? No, they are unutterable, or they cannot be heard just as the groanings of the Holy Spirit cannot be uttered. This then definitely leaves us as prayer makers out of the picture. We should let the Holy Spirit make the intercession for us rather than for us to make up some nice prayers to say to Yahweh, or worse still, to allow someone else to give us a nice prayer to say. Just as one relies on his spinal cord to make their intercession to the brain, in the same fashion, we should rely on the Holy Spirit, which is far more capable of attending to our spiritual needs. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. So. <coughs> Again, spinal cord intercessor, its function, we have that H uh, representing holiness and, and pointing to Elohim as the high priest of high priests, but also there is this connection to uh, the Holy Spirit as our intercessor, right? And so what does that look like and how in this specific example, how does that relate to prayer, right? So um, again, like it says, pray without ceasing, right? This body is always taking care of us doing what it needs to do to make sure that we continue to breathe. Our heart continues to beat all of that. All right. And so the same thing um, when we talk about the fact that we are to be still and to, to hand this over and to understand that Yahweh already knows everything that we need. Right. Uh, no confusion about that. Whereas we we, we may have other thoughts about what we need to, we, what we need next or what might be most beneficial to us, right? So we put that in his hand. We know we, it's already in his hand. We don't put it there, but our owning of the fact that that's the reality of it would make things a lot easier, right? So the, the last part of this with the peripheral nerves. So the peripheral nerves are pointing um, to Yahshua. And so they proceed out of the spinal cord. And so this is the um, concrete or physical, representing the concrete or physical manifestation of Yahweh. Okay. And there are uh, 31 pairs. So that would be 62. Um, and then... There is a terminal thread of the cord, and I may say this wrong. I meant to um, look it up to see how it was pronounced, but it's uh, they call it the thelum terminal. So that's the 63rd. So 63 generations of the flesh from Adam to Yahshua, the Messiah. That's the uh, what this is representing. OK, and so um, if you are in your Elohim book, there is a visual representation of that right after page 18 for those of you with the physical book. OK, and so, again, that's going to be uh, about him fulfilling and that all generations are saved in him. And so it speaks to the fact that um, he Throughout all of those generations, it tells us, says Yahweh Elohim is, has animated all of the generations of the flesh through spirit, right? And so we talked about this before uh, his ever presence when we were talking Wednesday, we were talking about the aorta and how the aorta carries life to all cells. And we said that that was represented um, by um, love and in the circulatory system, right? And how we have that seven branch golden candlestick and how that is also representative of his presence in all seven ages and dispensations. And so we know that life and light are synonymous, right? So again, ever presence of Yahweh manifested in all of these systems. Same thing we see with the skeletal system and strength when we talk about the fact that he is our uprightness and we see that represented in the vertebral column. So these 
these themes or principles, they are appearing continuously as we study the systems. And so here it's represented in that 63 spinal nerves that are under direct control of the brain. All generations of the flesh um, are under the dictates of Yahweh. That's what that is representing, okay? And so um, what they do when they close that up, this comparison that they make, they talk about the fact that as we discussed with DNA, uh, the spinal cord always carries out the will of the brain. So there is no deviating from the purpose, right? Um, and so uh, Yahweh's purpose is being carried out regardless of what role we think we could possibly play, right? Okay, so those are, that's the three and one. And so then um, there were just two other things that I wanted to highlight for us. So like I said, they will often go back, not just give us the functioning, but how it relates to the pattern or some principle. So if we can get John 15, uh, one and two, where they're going to talk about the grafting in of the Gentiles. Um, and then if we can read this one paragraph on page 20, they're going to show us how this is represented in uh, our nervous system. So it's going to be uh, on page 20 for my reader. Go ahead. We can get John 15 first. That's fine. John 15, 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So they're going to go ahead, thank you, Shirley, and make this analogy for us. Um, so on page 20, it's going to be the third full paragraph. It says the whole nervous system can be likened unto a branching tree. So we'll read that one paragraph quickly. The whole nervous system can be likened unto a branching tree with the spinal or peripheral nerves representing the branches and the spinal cord representing the trunk of the tree. Whenever a peripheral nerve is severed, crushed, or damaged, the portion of the nerve distal to the point of severance degenerates throughout its whole length. However, a new nerve will regenerate or grow back in its place after a period of time if the nerve cell body, which is proximal to the severance point, is not damaged or injured. The growth of the new nerve fiber, sheath-like covering, neurolemma of the old degenerated nerve. The neurolemma, who I missed. One second. The growth yeah. of the new nerve, the growth of the new nerve fiber proceeds from the undamaged end of the severed nerve and grows along the path maintained by the sheath-like covering neurolemma of the old degenerated nerve. The neurolemma cells aid greatly in this process. Thus, there is a new nerve formed after many months and regeneration is complete. This is typically the same process that is used in the process of grafting and horticulture. You can go ahead for the explanation and read that. He's going to let, so he's going to tell us. So this is similar to the grafting in, right, of uh, the Gentiles to replace the unbelieving Jews. Go ahead. Yahshua the Messiah said in speaking to the Jews, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. John 15, 1 and 2. 
He was speaking of those Jews who did not repent and submit to John the Baptist's water baptism of repentance, or they were broken off in that they did not receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Those that did submit to John's baptism were planted by water baptism into the Messiah's death so that they might be in the likeness of his resurrection. Romans 6, 1 through 5. These was manifested as fruitful branches on the day of Pentecost, whereas the unbelieving Jew was manifested as a dead branch and had to be plucked off are taken away by Yahweh. Now, right where these dead branches were taken away, the Gentiles as new branches were grafted, not planted by water baptism into the spiritual body of Elohim. The apostle Paul speaks of this clearly by likening the Gentiles as the branches of a wild olive tree, which were grafted into a good olive tree after its dead branches, the Jews were broken off. Romans 11, 16 through 24. Therefore, we can see how beautifully the purpose of Yahweh is served by the process of the regeneration of nerves in our own physical bodies, which is typically a grafting process. Please be advised that a nerve will not regenerate if it is damaged completely back to its roots, the nerve cell, which is the same thing as saying that the Gentiles could not be placed into the body of Elohim by water baptism, which was the root or foundation of repentance. Hmm. Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. Neither could a Jew be entered into the spiritual body by water baptism after the death burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. Please refer to the volume of this book called The Prophetic Birth and Mission of John the Baptist and Yahshua the Messiah. Thank you, ma'am. So remember, we talked about this on Wednesday as well, why this is called a textbook, because the explanations are here, right? And then they even let you know, in like in this section, here's where you can go for further exploration of this topic if it's of interest to you right so I, i'm pointing out places again for to, to pique your interest and help you to say okay this is where i want to go next but i i don't really have to um uh, nobody really has to when they're going into the elohim book the explanation is there right so we're we're, we're walking through this together the, but the explanation again is there. That's why it's such a, a beautiful resource to have um, if we can, if we have that time to sit aside and, and really get into it and read it. So, like I said, we have the point that was made about prayer. We have this other point that was made about being grafted in these different principles that are highlighted. And the last one that I wanted um, to point out this morning, let's see, I'm just looking at my time, make sure I'm okay. Um, Let's, uh, I think, I think we can do them both. Dispensations and ages run throughout many of these uh, systems. And so this is, so like, we'll look at it later. It's in the skeletal system when they show you like how your cranium, how there are all these different uh, sections in there. Uh, you also will see it in the reproductive system, but it is also represented in this system, in the nervous system, when we talk about voluntary and involuntary. So um, let's go ahead at the bottom of 21 and we'll get the full thought. And it says, this brings us around to another consideration, which is very important to look into, right? And so why, um, what's, what is the principle associated with voluntary and involuntary systems? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This brings us around to another consideration, which is very important to look into. We all know that there are some functions of our physical bodies that are under our voluntary control. That is, we can elect to do 
are not to do according to our own will. And we need not be reminded that we oftentimes do the wrong thing in respect to our body. There are a great number of physical ailments that plague mankind, which are due to indiscriminate judgment as to what he should or should not do. So let us all witness to the fact that the functions that are carried on through the voluntary nervous system sometimes go awry. But thanks be to Yahweh, the more important and vital functions of our body are not under the control of the voluntary nervous systems or man's will, but are under the control of the involuntary or autonomic nervous system. Such vital functions as the control of the heartbeat and the digestion of the food, etc., are not subject to the will of the man, but are carried on automatically by the involuntary nervous system. The voluntary nervous system can be likened unto the dispensation of the Mosaic law when Israel tried to follow Yahweh's laws, but failed miserably. And the involuntary nervous system can be likened unto the dispensation of grace where one is controlled and guided by the Holy Spirit automatically. When one is led by the Holy Spirit, he does not have to take any thought of what he should do or say, but the Holy Spirit, which is the same spirit, spirit law that governs and controls the whole universe and keeps it in order, also does the same for us. However, there is still a deeper consideration. Oh, one second, that- one second, I'm sorry. That's getting ready to get into the, the last part of it. All right, so voluntary, involuntary, right? So he's showing us the two different uh, periods are representing here when they're under the law right? And then when they're in the dispensation of grace. And so again, this notion that we can make daily choices about whatever kind of food that we want to eat, but the reality is our bodies are conditioned in such a way that, and we read about this Wednesday, they know how to extract the essence, right? So they're, they're going to keep what is uh, good uh, from whatever we are taking in and and that's what they're going to use so to speak as the building blocks for this body to keep it running right so uh even if we're not able to always uh stay on the straight and narrow so to speak about that intake the body is making decisions about what it's going to hold on to and what is going to uh um push back out, right? Eliminate because this is enough substance. You got to go back out there and get something else because we haven't been fulfilled, right? So um, again, the, the notion that was presented to us before, he's in control of everything, right? And he is going to uh, govern us our spirits, um, just as he, he has this body governing itself, right? So that um, if it is, if we are his righteous spirit and it's meant for us to, to uh, fulfill that, then we will have what we need to do. He'll be, that'll be given to us to be able to do it. And accordingly, what we're getting ready to see here in this last part that I'm sharing this morning, where it talks about those two mysteries operating throughout this body and how they're manifested in the nervous system, uh, that you're you you will serve him the question is are you serving him in righteousness or unrighteousness so there are a few examples in the nervous system with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and then with the vermis and the vagus nerve that show how those two mysteries are operating um we talk about how they're operating throughout time side by side right well they're also going to show us how they're operating within the body so go ahead vanessa um and um, throughout the rest of this paragraph, it's going to talk about that sympathetic and parasympathetic working right alongside each other. And then we'll go back and look at the vermis and the vagus nerve. Okay, we're on page 22, second sentence from the top. However, 
there is still a deeper consideration in that when one analyzes the autonomic nervous system, he finds that it is divided into a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system. A sympathetic nervous system, even as the name implies, is sympathetic to our physical needs and pertains to the righteous Elohim, whereas a parasympathetic, para means beside or nearby, pertains to the unrighteous, Satan or Lucifer, and is antagonistic or opposed to the sympathetic. For instance, the sympathetic nerve fibers serving the heart quicken the pace of the heart, whereas the parasympathetic fibers impede or slow the heart rate. But the two kinds of nerve fibers are vitally necessary for the interaction of the two, which bring about a desirable balance or end result. This is the very way that the purpose of Yahweh is carried out. For he created Lucifer or Satan so that he might get himself honor and glory in overthrowing him, Romans 9, 17. So Satan is just as necessary in the purpose of Yahweh as is Elohim. They both work side by side in bringing about the desired aim of the eternal creator. And both of these, both Elohim and Lucifer, are spiritual beings that have power and control over mankind, the former unto eternal glorification and the latter unto eternal damnation. Thank you, Shirley. And so again, this this um, counteraction, right? So it's not just seen with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. If we back up uh, page 19 on to 20, they're going to talk to us about the vermis, uh, which is this worm or snake like figure. And so again, they're talking about how in the Garden of Eden, we had Satan and that tree of life. How is that represented in the physical body, right? And then they go on to tell us about this vagus nerve as well. So if we look at the second to last paragraph, on page 19, we'll go ahead and uh, discover how these two mysteries are represented within the body. So second to last paragraph on page 19, I may have said 219, I'm sorry. Yeah, you said 19. We have already, <clears throat> we have already made reference to the cranial cavity with the brain therein representing the most holy place of our physical body. This would further correlate to the Garden of Eden, according to our pattern. Since we have done so much talk about Satan or the serpent deceiving Eve in the Garden of Eden, and also we have spoken of the tree of life also in the garden, we should be able to show in in these the cranial cavity of the brain. In the cerebellum, a portion of the brain below and behind the cerebrum, cerebrum, or main part of the brain, there is a peculiar branching like effect of the nerves, which the anatomists, is that how to pronounce, have named arbor vita, which means tree of life. Furthermore, in this same area, there is a portion of nerve tissue that divides between or separates the two halves of the cerebellum, just as Satan or the serpent intervened between Adam and Eve by deceiving the woman, 1 Timothy 2.14. And the anatomists have named this portion of tissue the vermis, which means worm or snake. According to our pattern, this places the serpent or the devil or Satan first in heaven or the most holy place from whence he was cast out into the earth, 
the outer court by Michael and his angels. Revelation 12, 7 through 9, King James Version. Therefore, since we have located this worm in the most holy place or head region of our physical body, we must find a representation of him in the outer court, the abdominal region of our body. And sure enough, we find the same word, vermis, in the, in the vermiform shape of a worm, appendix, which is an organ in the abdominal cavity that no useful that serves no useful purpose whatsoever. It can only cause trouble, that is, sickness or death, just as a devil causes us to be spiritually sick or dead. There is another physical manifestation of the devil being cast out of heaven as shown by the nervous system. We have already spoken of the 12 special cranial nerves, and one of these nerves is called the vagus nerve. The word vagus means wanderer, and Satan is a vagabond or wanderer in the earth plane. Genesis 4, 14, Job 1, and 7, 1 Peter 5 and 8. And he was in heaven before he was cast out into the earth. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 14. And he was a beautiful and wise angelic spirit and was given dominion in heaven. But due to his exalt, his exalting himself above Elohim, he was cast out with his host, but the other angels did not leave their heavenly estate. Jude 6, verse. We have already spoken of how the 12 cranial nerves serve their function in the head region, but the vagus nerve is the only one of them that leaves the head region and courses down through the chest cavity and go courses down through the chest cavity and on down into the abdominal cavity, where it ends by distributing a few fibers to the gut. Thus, it typifies Satan being cast out of heaven into the earth. Likewise, Judas, or Satan, one of the 12 disciples, fell headlong and burst asunder in the midst with his bowels gushing out, Acts 1 and 18, after he had betrayed Joshua the Messiah. All right. Thank you. Okay. So remember when we started, I, I don't know, like it gets me excited. It makes me very happy um, when I read through this and we all have to ask ourselves individually, like, okay, is this enough witnesses or do I need more? And if you need more, there are plenty of other systems. You can move from the body to the creation itself, however you want to work it. But it goes back to uh, the point that we make all the time in class. There is substance to what we are given. There are witnesses to support it. You're, you're not coming and um, receiving something empty. You're not coming and listening to the promises of a man, so to speak, right? Or worshiping men. Uh, it's just, it, it, it's beautiful. And you pray that he... Uh, gives you the appreciation for all of the evidence that he has provided for his existence, who he is, how he actually exists. And again, if you have to take the process of uh, trying to prove it wrong, do that, what, whatever, whatever it needs to be for you uh, to be able to accept the proof that has been provided. Uh, but I enjoy going through all of this and seeing, like I said, it's, 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 it doesn't stop with um, as if it wasn't enough, aligning uh, the tabernacle as far as structures, because remember we talked about that before, anatomy, right? and physiology. So the first part are the, is the structural alignment. It doesn't stop there with the alignment of vessels. It also goes on to align functions, right? And then to align to particular principles, uh, to attributes. It's just whatever angle that you would like. 
So whatever you may be, wherever you may be in that track, wherever you may be on whichever chart, if you choose to, you can bring it back to this physical body and show how those same principles are manifested in this physical body, right? So he's given us the knowledge uh, to be able to run this however we like to run it. Uh, if we're invested in doing the reading and the studying to see all the food that he's laid out for us. Um, so just quickly, they made that reference to the 12 cranial nerves. So for those of you who are into numbers, he talks about the fact that those are pairs. So that's actually 24. And then he talks about how those 24 are representative of the 24 elders. And he continues to do this throughout, right? We'd already talked about the 63 and they'll talk about other numbers throughout it. And, it, and it's, it's, um, it's just so uh, solid the way that it, it it's put together. It it's it's wonderful. And you know, I was saying I I would just do a chunk this morning because this isn't even everything. I I haven't even covered everything that's in the the part of the nervous system. So I just wanted to chunk it for you all a little bit so that you have something to digest, and um, then we'll try to wrap it up later. But I hope that you were able to uh, get something out of that and to just really see how this uh, physical body can, can be used as a whole other uh, set of witnesses to go into whatever it is that you are going into when you're on the floor. Uh, so I hope somebody has uh, gotten something out of it. And with that, hallelujah. 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 Very good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Um, okay, class, I will take the second portion of class. Good morning again. This is Carla Carter. I thoroughly enjoyed the first speaker and the foundation that was laid. So many different ways we can go with it to finish it up or to summarize. We're just going to wait to see which way y'all always take this and grab some water. So if we can go back to the very first part that was read this morning, I think it was page 18. And Sonia, I'm going to ask you to help me um, get to these references a lot faster, just for the sake of time. Um, it was page eight. Was it page 18? The very first part that was read, um, read this morning. About the unity, is that part? Yes, the 18 was the first. Um, okay, what was the... Threefold nature? Was it right here? We have already gone to great stream. Yes. No. This is where we started. Okay. If we can read that one more time. Um, yep, that's it. If we can read this paragraph here on page 18 of the textbook. Uh, okay. And then if somebody can get it, well, no, just read this part first and then we'll see where we go. Okay. We have already gone to great extremes to get it across to our readers that Yahweh is spirit, John 4, 24. Okay, Paul. So Yahweh is spirit. I'm going to bring up the chart too, and we're going to go back and forth. So Yahweh is spirit. I want it to be clearly understood that Yahweh in his pure spirit state, it's only represented by this cloud only because we take the natural to understand the spiritual because the cloud has no particular shape or form. And in this state of existence, Yahweh being pure spirit itself, pure intelligence, pure knowledge, wisdom, there was no shape, no form, no concepts, no opinions, no, no up, no down, no in, no out, no truth, no lie. It was just Yahweh in his pure spirit state alone and by himself. When Yahweh decides, every time he decides to create, he, it is, it's his nature to create the same way. Yahweh takes on a discernible shape and form, or Yahweh goes into, uh, moves into the shape and form, which we know is Elohim, and then Yahweh manifests in the flesh. You have Yahweh 
which we call abstract, which there's no particular shape or form. You have Yahweh in an intermediate state, and then Yahweh in concrete state. This is his supernal nature. If we can read Romans 1, 19 and 20, and we'll come back to this um, again. So Romans 1, 19 and 20, please. Romans 1, 19 and 20. Great. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Now, for now that which I'm sorry, that which may be known of Yahweh, the things that may be known of this invisible creator that you cannot see or perceive with your natural mind at all by any means, the things that may be known of him are clearly seen clearly seen, being understood by the things that he made. Read. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature so that they are without excuse. So what this is saying, and he, the them that he's talking about is Israel because Yahweh gave this pattern to Israel. This tabernacle pattern that was given was given to Israel. That which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them for Yahweh showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Yahweh from the creation of the world. Why is that important? Because nobody was there when he created anything. Nobody could even know how these things came about at all unless Yahweh revealed it to a man. And the man that he chose to reveal that to was Moses. And so he showed Moses the pattern by which he created the entire world. Even from the creation of the world, they're clearly seen. Even his eternal power and his nature is clearly seen by this pattern. So his, his supernal nature goes according to this pattern. But Yahweh himself, in that pure spirit state, is just Yahweh a unity. Yahweh is alone and by himself. Yahweh himself, in that pure spirit state or in the state of rest, is not threefold. Now, when Yahweh takes on shape and form as Elohim, Elohim, Yahweh in that state is the archetype, original pattern of the universe. And in that state, you have Yahweh, the Father, Yahweh, the Word of Son, and Yahweh, the Holy Spirit, all in that one embodiment. And his supernal nature can be understood by that one embodiment, by that pattern. And so he showed Moses that pattern in the mount. So his supernal nature by which he creates things. First John 5 and 7, King James Version. His supernal nature can be understood by the things that he made also. So go back to the Elohim book, and then we're going to talk about this pattern. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so we can't do a whole bunch of bunch of reading, but we'll see. Um, so go back to this, uh, read the very first sentence one more time and keep going. We have already gone to great extremes to get it across to our readers that Yahweh is spirit, John 4, 24, and that everything lives and moves and has its being within spirit, Acts 17, 28. This spirit is the source and substance, the limits and bounds of everything, both, vis both invisible and visible. Yahweh in that state is without any descriptive shape and form, but he took on a shape and form within himself that can only be seen in a vision. And it is by this shape and form, Elohim, that all things, invisible and visible, spiritual and materialistic, are created. And he, Elohim, and he, Elohim, is the archetype pattern for everything that is created. 
pause. So he just said the same thing that I said. So that's what I was trying to explain. So Yahweh in that state or Yahweh in this state has no particular shape or form at all. But when Yahweh takes on shape and form right within himself as Elohim, it is by this manifestation or in this state was all, all things were created from this state by this pattern of himself. For C said he. So this pattern or Elohim, Yahweh Elohim himself is the pattern by which he created all things. And the first speaker talked about Wednesday and today, the, uh, the attributes that took on the shape and form and the pattern by which they did so. And so when we look at that, we look at, I don't know if you can see this chart big enough now, I can't blow it up because it's on the PowerPoint. But um, when you look at the attributes that make up this shape and form, Elohim, you have intelligence being the crown. That is the source from which everything comes from. There, it is utterly impossible to have wisdom and knowledge without there being intelligence first. That it is utterly impossible to have any of the other attributes without having intelligence first. Intelligence is the source from which all every everything comes from. So that is the source. And then wisdom, knowledge, beauty, love, justice, foundation, power, strength, understanding, faith. That is the substance that he used to create. That is the substance. Yahweh is source and substance. You have intelligence being the source. You have the rest of the attributes, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, love, beauty, justice as the substance. Source being represented by the masculine or the male. Substance being represented by the, um, the woman or the female or the feminine. And so he said by wisdom and knowledge, he founded the earth. Is that what, what he says in the, in the Bible? It does. And we may touch that, I don't know. But then also the speaker had it read last Wednesday about how these attributes correspond to the nine systems in the body. And they also correspond to the nine major vessels in the tabernacle. And so intelligence corresponds to the nervous system. Wisdom corresponds to the reproductive system. And knowledge corresponds to the endocrine system. And this is important how it's brought down. And then from this triad was birth, beauty, love, and justice. And then from this one was birth, foundation, power, and strength. And that's how the attributes came um, into this organized, organized now, shape and form. If you look at how a child is formed in the mother's womb, and you use these systems, to correspond to these attributes, and you also use these attributes to correspond to the tabernacle um, pattern, the vessels in the tabernacle, the baby comes into existence the exact same way. The brain has to be first, and then you have um, the heart, and then you, all of those systems that form the baby are the exact same way it came into the, cre the creation, came in by the pattern. And the exact same way Yahweh showed Moses how to actually build this tabernacle pattern. He didn't build it where it was, you know, these three were made first, and then you had this one, and then this one, and then that one, and then this. It wasn't like that. And so we'll look at that in just a second. And so wisdom and knowledge represents the reproductive system and the endocrine system. And it talks about how the reproductive system and endocrine system, they actually go together. You can't have one without the other in, in order to bring forth life or to reproduce. You have to have both. If the endocrine system is not working properly, then the reproductive system cannot do its job. And if the nervous system is not working properly, none of it works. And so it, it all goes hand in hand. So hopefully um, we can visit this again and tie it all together. Now, talking about this pattern, let's see, y'all, which way we want to go with it. Because we don't have a lot of time. Let's go to. Paul was talking about how Yahweh showed it unto them. So let's go where Yahweh showed it unto them. So let's go to Exodus and we'll do it that way. Um, 
Now we know that uh, Yahweh actually came to uh, Moses in the third chapter of Exodus and gave him a vision at the burning bush when it was time for Yahweh to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And so I want to show you this real quick. Now, this migratory pattern is the same pattern by which Yahweh actually created the um, heavens and earth. Yahweh actually operated by that same pattern in this migratory pattern. And so just like the pattern that Yahweh um, gave Moses in the mount, in this tabernacle pattern, you have the most holy place, the holy place, and the court that goes around about the most holy place and holy place. And so you have these pillars and bars and boards that actually enclose the tabernacle or these the tent. Now you have this big tent that was separated by curtains or by what we call the veils, which were blue, purple, and scarlet linen curtains. And so this tent, you have the most holy place and the holy place. And then you have the board pillars and bars going around that tent. Right? And so in the court roundabout, you have these three major vessels here that were made out of brass. You have the art of I mean not art, the altar of sacrifice. Some of us call it the art of um, the altar of sin sacrifice, but it's the altar of sacrifice, which is made out of brass. You have the um the labor here, I'm sorry, I can't think. The labor here, and then you have the holy um cup of holy anointing oil. Then in the holy place, now with this going around the um, tent here, you have the first veil, or you have the curtains that actually separated or was the opening to the holy place from the court roundabout to the holy place. You have to go through the veil or through the door that leads you to the holy place. And this door was three feet wide for a reason, but that's a whole other story. In the holy place, you have these um, vessels. You had these two were made out of shittim wood and overlaid with gold. And then the, the seven branch candlestick was actually made out of beat out of gold. It was pure gold and it was beaten work. And so you have the altar of incense, the table of showbread, which had 12 loaves of bread on it, six on one side, six on the other side. And you had the seven branch golden candlestick that when the high priest had to put the oil in it for light, he had to go down the middle branch. And in this middle branch, once the oil goes down the middle branch, it fills up this way where it goes all the way down. It goes on one side, then the other side comes up one side, the other side comes up one side, the other side to the very top of the middle branch. And then between the holy place and most holy place, there was a second veil or blue, purple, and scarlet curtains that actually divided between the most holy place and the holy place. There's a blue, purple, and scarlet veil here and a blue, purple, and scarlet veil here that divided between the holy place and most holy place. And in the most holy place, it was completely dark. There was no light given in the most holy place whatsoever. Now, in the holy place, you have the seven branch candlestick that was supposed to be lit at three o'clock in the afternoon to give light all the way until they snuff it out at six o'clock in the morning. And so there was always light in the holy place. And when it was when it was um, when the sun was up, there was no need for the candlestick to be lit because it was lit by the light of the sun. But then in the most holy place, because it was covered up and it was separated by this veil, there was never any light in here at all. The high priest had ordered steps by which he had to operate and officiate in the most holy place. And the only time there was light in the most holy place was when the, the high priest on the day of atonement did all of the order services that he was given to make an atonement for himself the atonement for the children of Israel and the atonement for the sanctuary of the tabernacle. And once it was completed, there was a Shekinah or a flashing of the Shekinah here between the two archangels where the cloud abode upon the mercy seat. And there was a flash of light letting the high priest know that Yahweh had forgiven them for their sins for that year. That was the only time that there was light 
in that uh, most holy place. And so this is where light had to be, but there was always darkness here until the Shekinah flashed. Okay, so that's important. All right, so we got all nine major vessels in the tabernacle. All right. So if we can go to Exodus, let's do it in order. So once Yahweh came to the children of, to Moses at the burning bush, and he told, he gave him his name, and he gave him the signs, and he told him to go down into Egypt to bring his people up out of Egypt, because Yahweh had, so let me do it this way. Yahweh had made the promise to Abraham that he was going to give him a seed, multiply his seed as the sands of the sea, stars of heaven. Know for sure they would go down into a land and be placed in bondage for a period of time after which Yahweh would come in and deliver them out. Now, this promise was given to Abraham in Canaan land. Thank you, Yahweh, for bringing me back. When we look at this migratory pattern, it is actually the exact same as the tabernacle. Just like you have the most holy place, holy place court roundabout, you also have in this migratory pattern, Canaan land is like in the most holy place. And so it says um, most holy place here on the chart. And it's divided between the holy, most holy place and holy place, which is the wilderness, by the River Jordan. That would be likened to the second veil. And then you have the holy place and the outer court, which would be Egypt, separated by which we call the first veil, which is the Red Sea. And so you have the outer court, which is Egypt, the wilderness of Sinai, which is likened to the holy place, and Canaan land, which is likened to the most holy place. You have these two veils or these two divisions between the two, the Red Sea and the River Jordan. Okay. Now, Yahweh made this promise to Abraham when he was in Canaan land. Know for sure that they're going to be placed in bondage for a period of time after which I, Yahweh, will come in and deliver them out. I will bless thy seed. I will bless all families of the earth by that seed that I'm going to give you, Abraham. And we found out that that seed was Messiah. Now, the promise is made here in Canaan land, but the children of Israel did have to come down just like Yahweh t promised Abraham. And when they got down here, Yahweh multiplied them down here. They were multiplied as the sands of the sea and as the stars of heaven. Now, when they first came down, there was only 70 of them, 70 souls, because we're talking, we're operating by a pattern. Now, when they come down, there, only, there were 70 souls that came down. Now, when we look at this tabernacle pattern, you have seven steps. Zero has no value. So coming down from the most holy place or Canaan land down into Egypt, there were 70 souls. So that's coming down. But when they got down here, they were multiplied as the sands of the sea and as the stars of heaven. And when you look at the pattern, this gate was 30 feet wide. And there's a scripture that says, broad is the way that lead to destruction. But narrow is the way that lead unto life. And so he has to operate by a pattern. And so let's look at the pattern by which Yahweh operated, because we can know and understand him clearly by the things that he made, even his eternal power and his supernal nature, because he does everything by this same pattern. So let's see if we can get all of this in in the time that we have. So then. When they got down here, he multiplied them as the sands of the sea and as the stars of heaven. Because this is a pattern, there has to be some death and there has to be some destruction going on down here in the outer court or in Egypt. And just like Yahweh said it was, they were placed in bondage. There was a death decree during the time of Moses' birth. There was a lot of death and destruction going on down there. But we're talking about Yahweh's purpose that Yahweh set forth in order to bring his people out. Now, because we're operating by this pattern, let's see if we can see it all together. We have the most holy place, holy place, court roundabout, the outer court here. And so when it's time for them to come out, mm, mm. so when it's time for them to come out, we have to operate by those same seven steps that Yahweh had laid down in the tabernacle. So those seven steps are as follows. The first step in the tabernacle is the gate. The second step in the tabernacle is the altar of sacrifice or the altar of sin sacrifice. The third step is the brazen labor. 
The fourth step is the door or the second veil by which they, the um, high priest had to enter into the holy place. So the door is the fourth step. The fifth step is the holy place itself. The sixth step is the second veil itself. And the seventh step is the most holy place. So let's see if we can operate by the same pattern in this pattern in the uh, migratory pattern. And so when those constants come out, the first gate, I mean, first step in the pattern is the gate. And so the um, the death and destruction that goes into the gate. The second step is the altar sin sacrifice. You always told them to take out a lamb. They had to offer up that lamb. They had to take the blood of the lamb and strike the top of the doorpost, two sides and the different from a basin, giving you four points of blood. They had to roast the lamb with fire. They had to roast the lamb with fire with its inwards in it. And so on the altar of sacrifice, they also had to take the lamb, the blood of the lamb, and strike the four corners of that altar. And they had to roast that lamb with fire. And so this is the second step in the pattern by which Israel had to come out. Now, also, the third step is the brazen labor. So, of course, they have to come to some water, which is the Red Sea. And then the fourth step is the door. And so once they got to the Red Sea, Yahweh made an entrance for them to go to and through the Red Sea to get to the wilderness. And so that is your fourth step. And so the wilderness itself is the, um, the fifth step, which is the holy place. And then, of course, once they were here for 40 years, just like in the holy place, the high priest had 40 ordered steps that he had to do before he could actually go into the most holy place. You had from the um, door to the table was 10 feet. From the table to the altar of incense was 10 feet. From the altar of incense to the uh, candlestick was 10 feet. And from the candlestick back to the door is 10 feet. So you have 40 feet. But the high priest had some steps that he had to take um, do in here before he could actually go into the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, which was once a year on October 10th. And so Israel, 40 years had to go by before they could actually go on over and cross over this uh, second veil, which is Jordan River, and go into the seventh step, which is the most holy place, or Canaan land. And so that's the pattern by which Yahweh just decided to bring um, the children of Israel out of Egypt. Just like when we look at look at the green chart. When we look at the attributes here by which these things uh, took on shape, by which Yahweh took on shape and form as Elohim. You have the intelligence flanked by wisdom and knowledge, beauty flanked by love and justice, foundation flanked by power and strength. The way it came down um, like this is the way that we have to go back this way. So the way we go back to that state of consciousness before Yahweh came down as us, then the gospel has to be preached to us. And what is the gospel? He said the gospel is the power of Yahweh. So we have to pick up the power, right? So once the gospel is preached to us, we have to have, the, that's the power of Yahweh unto salvation. And Yahweh is giving us of his wisdom and his knowledge in order for us to actually be able to believe. So when the gospel is preached, that's Yahweh's wisdom and knowledge being preached to us. And it says over there, it says wisdom and knowledge shall be the strength of our salvation. And once that's done, a foundation is laid. And there shall nothing what is the foundation but the law and the prophets? That is the foundation. Once we receive the foundation, those that believe the justice of Yahweh shall prevail. So the justice of Yahweh was all those that believe Yahweh's just those that believe, then they are going on this side. Yahweh brings them on in. Those that don't believe, it's like that blood. That Yah, the impure blood, they're cast out. And then that those that the believe, we can see the love of Yahweh, how that Yahweh did lay down his life. Now we see the Messiah and by which Yahweh did all these things. That is the love of Yahweh. And it is so beautiful once we see it. And then what does it say? What does it say over there in um what scripture was that? Goodness gracious. Um Ephesians, I think it is. To know the love of the Messiah, which passes knowledge. Where is that at? I'm going to get back to um, the pattern. Where is that in Ephesians? Uh, Ephesians second or third chapter. Ephesians 3, um, I think 14. Ephesians 3, 14. Okay. Yeah, maybe 317. Mm -hmm. 
I'll look at it this way. Um, Ephesians 3.19. So go to um, Ephesians. I hope this is making sense. Um, Fourteen. Go to three fourteen. So keep in mind what I just said. Now, now when these, just like from the the migratory pattern, there was a coming down. When Yahweh took on shape and form as Elohim, that was a death too. That was a coming down, and he did that. He had to die in order for us to live. And so Yahweh, his intelligence, had to impregnate his wisdom and knowledge with his will. And wisdom and knowledge had to come together to in order to create. But Yahweh could not do it in this state because there was no shape and form whatsoever. There was no pattern, no shape. And form. It was just utter chaos in this state, if you will. And so he had to die in order for us to live. So he had to come down and um, willingly die by taking on the shape and form and his wisdom and his knowledge or the reproductive system and the endocrine system had to come together in order to create or to reproduce himself. You can't put, you can't, an apple tree can't bring forth an orange tree. Yahweh reproduced himself. And so when he took on this shape and form, that was a death and his wisdom and his knowledge had no choice like the DNA and the RNA. It, the, it, this is the RNA, it had no choice but to carry out what the DNA had set in for it to do. And so when Yahweh took on this shape and form as Elohim, his wisdom, his knowledge, his love, his justice, his beauty, his foundation, his power, his strength, all of that was necessary in order for him to bring forth. But his wisdom and knowledge was what founded the earth. His beauty Remember, we read it about the beauty. Now, the beauty of Yahweh was the ability to be able to have the power to be able to cause his creatures to be to be just as he is, to be one with him. That is the beauty. And so it took wisdom and knowledge to come together in order to bring these things forth for the whole purpose of Yahweh to reconcile it back to himself. That is the beauty of it. But in order to do that, you have to have the love of Yahweh. That's why he, that's why the Messiah was brought forth was for the love of Yahweh. That the, the Holy Spirit we pour out on all flesh, but all did not believe it. And that's the justice of Yahweh. And so all these things that are coming about his creation came in. It was instantaneously, yes. But the in order for us to understand it, the way he came down is just like this the migratory pattern here. All of it is the same. And so the way it came down, it has to go back. So this, just like this is first heaven, second heaven, third heaven coming down, going back. This is first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. And so the way we have to go back is by taking the same steps that we did to come down. And so you have to have, you have to have the power first. You have to have the power by the gospel being preached to you. And then you receive strength. And that's what establishes your foundation, the power and the strength. Is bonded together by the foundation that's laid. And there's no other foundation that can be laid on top of the Messiah. That's the law and the prophets, right? And so once that's done, it talks about it in the first chapter, how this is done. And once that's done, then you that's the justice of Yahweh being prevailed. Because since you believe, now you are able to become a son of Yahweh. That's the beauty. That's what the beauty was talking about. Yahweh having the ability to make his creatures be one with him as he is. And so once the foundation is laid and the power and the strength is there and the justice of y'all, because you did believe him, then you receive the beauty and the love of the Messiah. And that's what passes knowledge to you. Did we read it yet? I don't even think we did. Did we just read it? Because I don't even know who read it. We didn't read it. Let's go read it because I'm in, it's, it's a lot. So remember what I just said. Ephesians 3.14, we're going to come back because I'm running out of time. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the father of our savior, Yahshua, the Messiah, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant- Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the father of our savior, Yahshua, the Messiah, and his name is Yahweh, 
of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named by the one name, Yahweh. That is the, that's the whole purpose of Yahweh. Yahweh wanted many children. And so what he had to do was reproduce himself. Many, 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 many times. Abraham desired a seed. Not only am I going to give you a seed, Abraham, I'm going to multiply that seed as the sands of the sea and as the stars of heaven. And they had to go down and they came down to 70 souls. He multiplied them tremendously. But when they had to come out, they came out as one. Out of Egypt have I called my son singular. Only one came down, only one going back. That's the purpose of Yahweh. And so I bow my knees to the father of our Savior, Yahshua Messiah, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, read. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. What did we just say a minute ago? The, the way it came down is the way it has to go back. So you have to have that the gospel, which is the power of Yahweh, has to be preached first. And so the power strengthens you that Yahweh would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit, by his wisdom by his knowledge, by his truth in the inner man, because your soul is made up of the attributes of Yahweh himself. You will be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, read. That the Messiah may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's the substance. That's the substance. So that the Messiah may dwell in your heart by faith, read. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be so able. That you, wait, 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 no, 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 don't go too fast. No, don't go too, too fast. Now, that the Messiah may dwell in your heart because after first, Ephesians, first chapter of Ephesians talks about the process. So after the gospel is preached and you believe, then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit and you receive the Spirit, the Spirit or you receive the truth, or you receive the Holy Spirit, which is the knowledge and wisdom and revelation of Yahweh and his purpose. So once the gospel is preached and you have the power, you have the mere strength, and that is the foundation that is laid. Then you have the justice because you have the lead. Yahweh has set, set up something for you. Now he's granting you according to his riches of his glory. And then what was put in the altar of incense? What was hidden in the altar of incense? And the altar of incense represents beauty. What was hidden in that? But the garment of beauty and glory was the high priest had to put on to make atonement. And in the garment of beauty and glory, what did you have on those garments that the high priest had to put on? If not, but those 12 stones in his breastplate, which represents the children of Israel. And you had those pomegranates and you had those bells around the hem of his garment. Easy. That's what was hidden in the altar of incense, which represents the beauty of Yahweh. And what did we say the beauty of Yahweh was? Yeah, the ability for Yahweh to allow his creatures to become just as he is, giving you the power to become the sons of Yahweh. The same way it came down is the same way it's going back up. So once the gospel is preached to you and you believe it, that is the justice of Yahweh. And you receive the love of Yahweh. For Yahweh so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him. What is it now? Whosoever should believe on him. Should not perish. What happens to you? Should not. You shall not mm -hmm. perish. Mm -hmm. You shall not perish. But you shall have what? Everlasting mm -hmm. life if you believe on him. And so that is how he passes it to you. So once you believe and then the justice of Yahweh prevails and you see the beauty of it, that is how you become one with him. That is how beautiful this creation is. That is the whole purpose of Yahweh, why he took on shape and form in the first place was for him to be glorified by reconciling all things back to himself through Yahshua the Messiah. Mm. After his death, burial, resurrection. When somebody tell me what happened to that veil that was in the temple, it was rent in twain, right? 
that veil was rent in twain. There was no more need for an intercessor at that right. point. You right. have access to the Father right there within yourself. In you. That's and right. So no, <clears throat> no, it is the Holy Spirit that makes intercession for us. Yes, indeed. But that does not mean that you don't pray. You have to pray without ceasing. But it's only that when you have a knowledge and understanding of Yahweh and his purpose is when you know what to pray for. And it's not you praying anymore. It is the Holy Spirit in you that's mm-hmm. praying and making an intercession for you. And I'm going to prove that before I get through, before I sit down, because I'm standing up right now. Now, look, let me tell you, read. Go ahead and read, because I don't have to run out of time. Read. That the Messiah may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all sons what is the whoa, breath. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, mm-hmm. wait. That is the beauty of Yahweh, that he makes all his sons become one with him. And comprehending means what? That means you understand it. Get wisdom. Get knowledge. But in all that getting, you get you some understanding. See these things and not taking time out to understand them. He will grant you, look, Read it again. That the Messiah. Verse, one more time. Mm-hmm. That the Messiah may dwell okay. in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all sons what is the breadth and length mm-hmm. and depth and height, and to pause. know the love. Pause, pause, pause. So now that we're out of the court roundabout. Now we're in the holy place. Now we're leaving the holy place. Now we've, we've got the death, burial, resurrection now. We got the blood, water, spirit, 40 now that's in the holy place. Now what? Now what? We got it now. We got the Messiah. Now we got it. We see it. But now what? After that, you still got to go into the, whole, the most holy place. You still got to go up a little higher than that. Now we got to get to the wisdom and knowledge. And then what's left is the entanglement. That's the round trip that we have to make. The same way he came down is the same way we're going back. So after that is done, now you can comprehend with all sons what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to do what? And to know the love of the Messiah which passes what to you. So after you go get the love, now you got to go into the most holy place because that's where the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding is at. So the love of the Messiah, which passes knowledge, read. That ye may, might be filled with all the fullness of Yahweh. That Yahweh may be all in all. And now you know that you are the Father, you are the Son, and you are the Holy Spirit manifested in a physical body, just like it was when he came down. That's what this gospel does, and that's why we have to keep on preaching it. Yes, we preach blood, water, spirit, 40. Yes, we preach death, burial, resurrection. And then what do we do then? We take you on into a higher knowledge and understanding of what the reality of death, burial, resurrection, what the reality of blood, water, spirit, 40 is, because you cannot keep lingering in the holy place. They could not stay in the wilderness of Sinai. They had to be taken on over into Canaan land. And who was it that led them into Canaan land if not Yahashua himself? That is what we're talking about. The same way it came down is the same way it went back. I only got five minutes and I can't breathe. So let me try to do this real quick. Now, when Yahweh came to Moses, I don't have a whole bunch of time. So now Yahweh brought them up out of Egypt, just like he promised that he would. And it's a whole bunch in that too, that we could uh, show with the pattern. Because with the pattern that he showed Moses in the mount, I want to show y'all the order real quick. So we go to Exodus, the third chapter, when Yahweh came to Moses and told him, go down to Egypt, right? Came down to Egypt, Yahweh utterly destroyed Egypt for his son's sake and delivered them up out of the um, land of Egypt. He told Abraham that he was going to take them on over, that Yahweh was going to take them into Canaan land. Moses was sent down to deliver them up out of the land of Egypt. Now, he told Moses at the burning bush, this shall be a token unto you, Moses, that I, Yahweh, have sent you. When you bring the children of Israel out and serve me on this mountain, that's how you're going to know that I sent you, Moses. And so when Moses 
goes in. Um, so y'all on the night in the nineteenth chapter of Exodus, let's do this real quick. I'm, dang it, if y'all suffer me a little bit, I don't want to cut it off like this. Exodus nineteen. And boy. All right. So first, first, um, first. Nineteen chapter. Uh, hold on, just a second. So we talked about the order in which they came out, and it was going according to the pattern, right? So um. The blood on the door and all that was like to the second step and so forth and so on. So after they did that and they came out to the wilderness, now they're in the wilderness and you're on June 3rd. So first verse, uh, read 19 and 1 first, please. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Mm -hmm. For they were departed from Rephidium and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in oh, the wilderness. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't even have any time at all. So let me just talk about it then. Mm -hmm. So um, when the children of Israel were come out of Egypt, they were being tested a lot. And so I think it's in the 16th chapter of Exodus where it talks about um, where they had the manna, where y'all gave the manna and told them different things like that. That's a whole other story. 19th chapter of Exodus um, is where he's actually going to start uh, speaking to them, told them to come to the mountain. Three days he would speak to them. 20th chapter, he starts giving them the um, judgments and things like that. And he said, all that Yahweh said we would do and be obedient. 24th chapter of Exodus is when um, he called Moses, Aaron, they'd have a bayou, a bayou, seven of the elders of Israel, to the top of the mount, um, the plateau of Mount Sinai. And he told Moses to come up to the top of the mount. And so in 24th chapter of Exodus, if we could read that for me real quick, first verse, uh, first, if you got to go, that's fine. I, I, I can't do this now. I can't cut it off. Give it's, a few minutes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he said unto Moses, come up to Yahweh, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near Yahweh, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Okay, so Yahweh said, come now, Aaron, Nadab, by you, 70 elders of Israel, and worship afar off. So they had to come up on the plateau of the mount, plus Moses. Moses should go up alone by himself. And so Moses went up to the, I don't have a lot of time to do all the rest of it. So in the 24th chapter, uh, 16th verse, it said, And the glory of Yahweh abode on, on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And it says, And the sight of the glory of Yahweh was like a devour, devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so the reason why this is important here is really it said the sight of the glory of Yahweh was like a devouring fire on the top of Mount Sinai in the on top of the mountain, in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now, when they come about of Egypt, that cloud appeared, and that cloud is what had led them all the way to they got to Canaan land. And so, it was a pillar of it was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It has to be that way because we're operating by the tabernacle pattern. So, in the migratory pattern, you have to have the same thing: the cloud led them by day, the pillar of fire by night. So, when you read over here, what it says it was like devouring fire. This means this was in the evening. Now, Moses was supposed to go up early in the morning to do these other things. So he had to go up early in the morning, do the other things or whatever right here. Rose up early in the morning and built the altar. He had to have the 12 pillars. He had to do the sacrifices. He had to read the book to the people, sprinkle blood on them and all that. So by the time they go up into the mount in the 16th verse, it's evening time now. And so now you have the, the fire, the cloud is uh, a pillar of fire now because it's evening time. So when Moses goes up into the mount um, alone and by himself at the top of the mount and the cloud covered it six days, when Yahweh shows him the vision, it was already evening time. And so Moses, when he describes what he saw in these six days in the first chapter of Genesis, that's why it says in the evening and the morning were the first day. It doesn't say in the morning and evening. It said the evening and the morning were the first day is because Moses is given his account of what he saw each day that he was in that mount. And it started out first being evening when he first saw the very first thing that he saw in this vision. So that's why I want to point this out. So if we go to Genesis, the first chapter, I'm talking about how he made everything by the pattern now, the creation by the pattern. Now, in the beginning of the um, 
If we read Genesis first chapter for me, please. Genesis first chapter. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. Mm -hmm. and, and Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light that it was good. And Elohim divided between the light and between the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So that's the first day. Go back to Exodus, the 24th chapter for me. Exodus 24 and 18, it says, And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. It, has, it doesn't say anything of what he saw in the first six days. What said the cloud covered it six days. It says nothing about what he saw in the 40 days. Any of this is in here. So when we go to the very next chapter, the 25th chapter, this is actually what Moses saw after the seven, first seven days. So Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Seek unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering. You should take the gold, the silver, the brass, all these, these telling them everything to bring forth. This is all of the substance that they brought up out of Egypt that had no particular shape or form whatsoever. The gold, the brass, the silver, the none of it had any shape or form at all. It was without form and it was void. And so on the very first day of creation, it had to be that way because Yahweh is showing Moses how he brought the creation in by the pattern. The even from the creation of the world can be clearly seen being understood by the things that are made because Yahweh showed it unto them. This is what he showed them. So you have all this substance without any shape or form. This is like Yahweh's spirit without shape or form. What no, no, it was without form. It was void, basically. And he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. We don't read where Yahweh showed Moses a pattern other than right here. So when did he show him this pattern? Within the first 40 days that he was in the mount. And then it says, and they shall make an ark of shit. So this is the very first thing he's going to make. The ark of shit and wood with the two cubits and the archangels and all that overlaid with gold. And but, So the first thing that he made was the ark of the covenant. That was the very first thing. Why is that? And so when you look at the tabernacle pattern, I told you that in the most holy place, it was completely dark. It had no light whatsoever in it until you had the second eye that flashed above the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubim. And so in the very first day of the creation, when Yahweh said the earth was without form and it was void, Moses said the earth was without form and it was void and darkness was up on the face of the deep. He's looking at the creation by the pattern. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. That was, that's why this had to be the first thing to made because this represents light with a Shekinah flash. The very next vessel he had made was the, the uh, seven branch candlestick because that is representing, that, that, um, that represents light as well. And then you had the table of showbread, which every, when the high priest eats of that sh the table of showbread, that is that sustenance that gives him life or light. The Messiah said, I am the bread of life. And so these three vessels are the very first vessels that were made in the 25th chapter of Exodus. Now, if you really want to, and this is what we're going to be doing tomorrow in the basis and foundation class, because we start. Um, anyway, so the 25th chapter of Exodus corresponds to the very first day of creation. The 26th chapter corresponds to the second day of creation. The third day corresponds to the 27th so forth and so on. And so Yahweh showed Moses exactly how he created the, uh, brought the creation in by the same pattern that he told him to make when he was up there in those 40 days. So the first six days of creation, he showed Moses how he brought it in, but then he showed him why he brought it in that way. And he showed him the pattern of himself and how the pattern came about just like the creation did. And not only that, and I'm going to be done in just a second. So if we could read 
the first um, first six days of creation, Genesis, the first chapter. And then we're going to go, um, well, now I don't even have time for that. Yeah, dog, we have time. Maybe we'll do it another time. Maybe next uh, time we meet or whatever we can do it. But even the, even the same way that Yahweh brought in the creation by this particular pattern that he did, even when he destroyed Egypt, those 10 plagues that Yahweh put on Egypt correspond perfectly, identically with the first six days of creation by that exact same pattern. Everything that Yahweh does, his eternal power and his supernal nature operates by that exact same pattern. And the reason why that is so important is so that you will have something that you can rely on. You can have something consistent that you can trust in. And once you act, if you don't get it on this side, you may get it on this one. If you don't get that, you may get this one. And once you get it, then Yahweh will reveal the rest of it to you. And so Yahweh, whom shall he teach with knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Get me um, Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 10. And then we talked about the scripture lesson too with um, Solomon actual wisdom. And Yahweh granted him that. And the queen of Sheba came and she was like, I heard of the fame of Solomon and his wisdom, but they didn't even tell me all of it. You were way more wise than they told me you were. And no, there was nobody that had wisdom like Solomon. And never anybody after him, so said Yahweh. And the queen of Sheba, she was just all at his wisdom, right? And so go to Deuteronomy 4 and 1. I'm going to try not to disturb you, distract you, or stop you because it's like it's not out of time. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 4 and 1. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your Elohim, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what Yahweh did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, Yahweh thy Elohim hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did, did cleave unto Yahweh your Elohim are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Yahweh my Elohim commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath an Elohim so nigh unto them as Yahweh our Elohim for all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before Yahweh thy Elohim in Horeb, when Yahweh said unto me, gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Now, so the whole one of the reasons he gave them the tabernacle in the first place and the judgment and the law, he said that was their wisdom. That all the nations would be like, goodness gracious, what nation is like this nation? 
That's supposed to be their wisdom and their understanding in the sight of all the nations that to hear of the statutes and the judgments and the laws that Yahweh had given unto them. Surely this great this nation is a wise and understanding people. And we talked about how they were the Gentiles were grafted in. That was that's what Yahweh wanted in the first place. That's what he had set forth. That was his purpose. And then so for what nation is so great who has an Elohim so nigh unto them? That's the beauty. Remember the beauty. As Yahweh, our Elohim, in all things that we call upon him for. So you have to call upon him. That was the intercessor. That's the intercession. That's the altar of incense. If you can see the pattern while she was reading this, I can see the pattern in my head. And what nation is there so great that, his, that has statutes and judgment so righteous as this law, which I set before you this day, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. And don't forget about these things. Now, it was, the law was always spiritual that he gave them. Now, the ordinances were carnal, but the law was always spiritual. That's why the same law that was written on the first tables of stone that Yahweh gave Moses when he came down out of the mountain in the 24th chapter of Exodus, and he saw the golden calf, and he threw them down. Uh, not 24th, sorry. 32nd chapter of Exodus, he threw them down, and he had to hew out two tables just like the first one. And Yahweh wrote the exact same law on the second table of stone, and that is the law that was put in the Ark of the Covenant or in the most holy place of the tabernacle. That is the law that governs us even now. We know the difference between right and wrong. Now, last thing, um, Matthew 12 and 42. This is Joshua speaking. Um, Uh, they were asking him for a sign. He was like, evil and dusty generation, seek after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to you except for the prophet Jonah, so forth and so on, because they were they did not believe that he was the Messiah. They were, it was a lot of stuff going on. So um, the 42nd verse kind of ties into the scripture lesson too. And the reason why the scripture lesson was called, y'all, we did that, is to show how Solomon asked for wisdom instead of asking for anything carnal. And because he asked for that, Yahweh gave him that abundantly. And he still gave him the desires of his heart too. He still gave him natural physical riches too and natural physical things too. But he was glad that Solomon, because Solomon asked him for wisdom to teach Yahweh's people. And he didn't ask for his enemy's life. He didn't ask for anything else. So Yahweh gave that to him. And in the proverb, it, it talks about what Solomon saw with the wisdom that Yahweh gave him how you were supposed to conduct yourself with that wisdom. And so uh, 40, 1242 of Matthew, what did the Messiah say? The queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. That's right. Now, the Queen of Sheba came from all far, far, far to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Everybody was coming to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And now you have the one that actually gave Solomon his wisdom here and trying to teach them. And they wouldn't hear anything he had to say. And that's why he said in the judgment, she shall be she shall condemn this mate, this generation, because y'all have one greater than Solomon here and you won't hear his voice. And so when Joshua is speaking to you, Within your own heart and mind, whether it's through another vessel or within your own heart and mind, what is that? Hear his wisdom. Hear his look. It's time to go home. Yahshua passes knowledge so that we become we can become the sons of Yahweh. So the whole thing, and if I give you a whole bunch of scriptures of why we're supposed to be praying, Matthew six sixty nine, Matthew twenty six forty one, Mark fourteen thirty eight. Luke 6, 28, Luke 18 and 1, John 16, 26, Acts 8, 22, Peter 10 and 9, when Peter was praying, this is after he had the Holy Spirit. He was on, the, on top of the uh, housetop praying. So you do supposed to pray. I don't want anybody to take that the wrong way how it was said earlier today. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 13 through 15, 1 Timothy 2 and 8, Hebrews 13, 18, James 5, 13 through 16, a whole bunch of different scriptures. That was what, what you're supposed to pray with an understanding, though. And the reason why we're supposed to pray, not that prayer can change anything. Prayer can't change the purpose of Yahweh. What it does is it establishes your faith in him. Because Yahweh puts the prayer in you. Abraham didn't even want to see in the 12th chapter of Genesis. He wasn't even thinking about that. But Yahweh told him in the 12th chapter of Genesis that he was going to give that land to his seed before Abraham even wanted one. So Yahweh planted the seed for him to ask for a seed. And so when Abraham asked for a seed, in the 15th chapter of Genesis, 
It was a part, Yahweh was going to do it anyway. But because Abraham asked for it and Yahweh gave it to him in his old age when it was, he knew it was no way possible but Yahweh, that established Abraham's faith in Yahweh. So, yes, pray to your father. The also said so. If you will ask anything in my name, the father will give it to you. But you have to pray according to his will. And the only way you can even do that is once you pray and he don't give it to you, then you know it wasn't his will. But when you pray and Yahweh do it for you, you know it's his will. And you that establishes your faith and confidence in him. And so, yes, pray without ceasing. That's what he talks about. But with the, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. With groanings that cannot be uttered. That is true. But don't take that the wrong way and think you're not supposed to be praying. But anyway, I'm super duper ran out of time. I enjoyed um, Dr. Roberts Wednesday and today. Hopefully we'll um, get some more out of that um, Wednesday night as well. But I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, tomorrow we do have the basic foundation class. We're actually going to be going through some of this stuff with the pattern because we're in the 24th chapter of Exodus. Um, we're going to be having an assignment tomorrow night. So I'm excited about that. But um, I hope something's been said this morning to encourage everybody to read and study more. Um, get your Elohim books out. But get a profound knowledge and understanding of the law and the prophets first. So with that, I say hallelujah. All right, all right. All right, that concludes class for today. Are there any questions or comments? I have one question. Okay. You're talking about prayer here uh, according to the will of Yahweh. I'm looking for the scripture reference you made in Acts. Can you tell me what verse that is, please? Which one? Where um, Peter was praying? What does the verse say? And I can find it for you. It talks about... Um, uh, the, uh, how the Holy Spirit makes intercessions for we know not what to pray for? Um, uh, let's see. Romans. Find it. That's Romans 8, I think. 8 and 26. Yeah, yeah, I've got Romans 8, but you made another reference to Acts. Oh, no, I was just calling out different scriptures that talked about we're supposed to be praying. Um, uh -huh. I think uh, maybe Acts, Acts 8, 22, maybe. Uh, let's see. Acts 10th chapter. Um, Peter yeah, went I, up on Acts the house. 10, wow. Yeah, yeah it's Acts 10 and 9, but I also call it Acts 8 and 22. I think that's where it says, repent therefore of this wickedness and pray Elohim if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So I was just pointing out where they told this particular man to pray that Yahweh, you know, would change his heart, basically. That was just different scriptures where they were telling different people to pray and they were praying and stuff like that. That was Acts 8.22. But the scripture you're talking about is in Romans, so. Okay, thank you. No problem. Very good. Any other questions or comments? All right. Can I, can um, I make one quick um, comment? Yeah. Uh, it's just in reference to the whole, uh, uh, this whole series here that we've gone through the last couple of days. And it was uh, brought to mind, you know, being able to look at these, uh, these things that Yahweh's given us and understand that he is uh, just giving more confirmation that it was all about us, as you mentioned there in one, earlier in the, in the lecture that, uh, uh, that was his love for his children to be one with him. And we've been told that uh, we couldn't know him or we not, not should know him in his pure spirit state. If you go back to page 13 in the Elohim book and uh, well, page 12 down there where it talks about the two archangels being the witnesses, which you, we've covered that so much, so extensively today that it's, uh, it, it should, uh, it, I would say it should witness to itself. But I'll say this, uh, that, on the page 13, after finishing that paragraph that on page 12, talking about that, he said, the sum, therefore, of all that is written in the previous paragraph is that Yahweh has revealed of himself by two witnesses, the law and the prophets. If any man desire a knowledge of the inscrutable, invisible, and comprehensible Yahweh, 
who is spirit, he must surely seek his two witnesses to come to this knowledge, for there are three that by record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. The Word and the Holy Ghost are really the two witnesses of the Almighty Yahweh, the Father. So we're basically uh, saying that we didn't, couldn't know him and is in a uh, pure spirit state, that, that knocks that completely out of the park. Uh, you can't know mm -hmm. him as he really is and actually exists. With that, I say thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right, so the announcements for this week, of course, we have class um, every Sunday from 10 a.m. This is, uh, just so y'all know, this is 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Time. And then the Basics and Foundation class is every other Monday, which will start tomorrow. We have one tomorrow, and it'll be the, um, every other Monday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Central Time. So the Eastern Time is 8 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. The business for 7 to 9. I'm sorry that some issues. Um, and then the website, again, if you want to, um, if you need the Elohim book, you can go to the website soulfood.org, S O H L, which stands for School of the Highest Learning, soulfood.org. And the um, Elohim book is there amongst other things. And you can email us at Meridian Soul, S O H L, at gmail.com or I D M R Meridian M S at gmail.com. And we'll um, respond to the email. All right, nothing else. We'll conclude with the back following taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Let everyone say hallelujah. 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 Thank <laughs> you.